Hello and welcome to the Reviews Brothers, where we have been going through the entire A to Z of the PS2 library, picking out 10 games per letter that don't get talked about all that often. And here we are at the letter Z, or Z, or however you want to say it, with 10 more games. That's a whopping 260 games that I've looked at in this series, but that doesn't mean it's over. As always, we have a decent mix, and yep, expect a lot of zombies in here. And now, how about I shut up, you press that subscribe button, and we take a look at some games. First up is Zapper, a 3D platform game that has a lot in common with arcade classic Frogger. You are Zapper, one wicked cricket. Your brother, a grub, has been taken away by a bird, which is quite annoying. The bird accidentally leaves behind an egg though, so you set out across 20 levels or so following the trail of eggs that's been left behind, until you find your brother. And of course, you need to crush all the eggs that you do find because you're an evil bastard. So the game is a 3D platform one, but it plays more like an arcade game. The camera is fixed and the levels are essentially made up of squares. Zapper will move one square at a time and knowing this, you'll need to explore each level to destroy the six eggs hidden in each one. Doing this will end the level. But there's plenty more to do. As you can imagine, the levels are full of obstacles and enemies. Normally you can hop one square at a time, so if a gap is larger than that, you'll need to jump and hover with the X button. This lets you cover two squares. You also have to look out for what you're jumping on, as a lot of the scenery can disappear, move or crush you if you're not careful, and the game is purely one hit deaths. You need to plan ahead and you really need to keep an eye on what you're doing. There are enemies, which come in the form of a range of other animals and insects and even robots. None of them really chase you or anything like that, instead they have patterns that they follow. There's no timer on the level, so it's a good idea to take it slow the first few times you play so you can see what's coming up and to check the routes that enemies take so you can avoid them. You do have an attack, you can zap things with your antenna, but this doesn't kill most things, only stuns them. You can also use the zap to destroy the various boxes around the levels. These contain power-ups and extra lives as well as fireflies. There's a hundred fireflies on each level to collect. But also, they help with power-ups. There's certain boxes that contain more powerful attacks to destroy, but to use the more powerful attacks, you need to have collected a certain number of fireflies on that level. It is an incentive to get them all, and it always tells you how many fireflies you need. They are generally pretty easy to find though. There's also lots of hidden areas in the levels. These are normally in doorways or passages that can be easy to miss and contain more lives and fireflies generally. The levels do get a lot more complex as you play, with moving platforms all over the place and different maze-like paths to take, and the variety is pretty decent. Looks-wise, it is pretty standard for a game like this, but I do like the cartoony graphics, and it's pretty sharp. The controls are decent and responsive, though it did take me a while to get used to moving square by square rather than just like a 3D platform game. You also need to use the shoulder buttons to turn left and right on the spot, as pressing the D-pad or analog in a direction makes you jump one square in that direction. It doesn't take too long to get used to though. While it can get a little repetitive, this is a fun little platform game that is basically Frogger but with a different character, though that's not a bad thing. Zathura is an action-adventure game based on the movie, which is a sequel to the original Jumanji, and I actually quite like that movie. Thankfully, the game is also pretty fun. It roughly follows the plot of the film where two brothers are at home with their sister in their new house. The youngest one goes to the basement exploring and finds a board game, starts to play it, and whatever happens in the game happens in real life. This one, rather than being a jungle though, is set in space, so your house is set into space and evil robots and alien reptilian things are all over the place trying to kill you. You've got to survive it all and end the game so you can get back home. The game is a 3D platformer where you take control of a few different characters, mainly the brothers Danny and Walter. These do your usual action platform stuff like running, jumping, climbing and so on. Depending on who you are, you've got different attacks. Danny's got a laser gun that you can get various types of ammo for to take out the enemies, as well as shoot the boxes that contain power-ups. Walter starts out with no weapons, but soon finds a massive wrench that he uses to smash enemies to pieces. Levels all play similarly, you're one of the boys, and you don't get to choose which one you have to explore parts of your house which is now a massive spaceship. You basically just need to follow the fairly linear path into each room, which will then of course lock you in and have some sort of platforming puzzle or buttons to press or enemies to destroy so you can escape and make it to the next room. Eventually you'll fight a boss, which is often a big robot thing, and you'll make it to the next stage. 
There's a lot of enemies in the game and the combat is fairly easy. You can look onto bad guys and this makes Danny's sections nice and simple as it's easy to circle strafe and you've got a dodge button as well. Walter can be trickier as he's melee based, but you can actually hit enemy lasers back at them with a well-timed attack, which is actually pretty effective and a good way to deal with them. The actual platforming here can be tricky though, mainly due to a very erratic camera that moves all over the place and can often be too close or too far away from you to be much use. You do get unlimited lives though, and you're never sent too far back if you do die. Most of my deaths were due to falling into bottomless pits rather than enemies killing me. Later in the game, you also get to play as one of the evil robots that you manage to reprogram to be on your side. This is cool, and the game basically then plays as a shooter. It doesn't look bad for a licensed game, there's not a whole lot of variety in terms of design and look, everything is basically grey or brown, but the animation is good and there's some decent cutscenes. I had a little look at reviews and this got absolutely panned by critics, but I have to say I think that's a little undeserved. Sure, it's not the best game ever made, but it's a fine, average action adventure that you can beat in a couple of hours, and I think it's fun enough while it lasts. It's also bloody cheap these days too, so well worth a couple of quid that you can get it for. Fighting game time now with Zatch Bell Mamondo Fury. This is a 3D fighter of sorts based on an anime which I once again have never seen or really heard of. There is a daft plot where every thousand years Mamodo children are sent to Earth along with a magic spellbook each, but don't ask me what a Mamodo child is. Each of the punk kids then seems to follow around whoever picks up their associated book, and they each have magical properties. For whatever reason, this means you have to go around fighting all the other people that have the book so you can have the best Mamodo person. It's a strange premise, but actually the game turned out to be one that I had to keep coming back to. You have a few game modes, there's story mode, arcade mode and multiplayer modes, as well as this you can unlock mini games that you can play throughout the story. You'll want to start with the story mode though, as pretty much all the characters and arenas to fight in are locked until you've done their respective levels. These battles are pretty fun though. You play as Zatch in story mode, and you've just found your book. You'll need to run around a 3D arena where your little punk mate will follow you around. You only have to worry about a few buttons, and there's no complicated fighting mechanics or combos here. Instead, everything is done with your magic book. You press square to do a magic attack, you start out with just one basic blast, and you need to attack your opponent's Mamodo, not the human character. Levels are filled with obstacles and things to hide behind to block enemy attacks and so on. There's even things that you can interact with later in the game. As you fight opponents, all of which have their own set of spells, you get stronger. You earn points depending on how well you battle, and these can be used between fights to upgrade your Mamodo, to make their spells more powerful, or make your little mate faster or more aggressive, and that sort of thing. It's pretty cool, and I found that I actually did care about how I powered up to best match my playstyle. You also learn a few new spells as you play. These are done just by pressing square, but basically when you press it, an indicator appears on screen and builds up a bar. Then you have to let go when it reaches the level of the spell you want to use. This works fine for the most part, but it can make it easy to use the wrong spell a lot of the time. You also have limited energy, so if you spam your magic, then you'll have to wait for it to recharge. And of course, the more powerful attacks use more energy, so you can't just use them over and over in quick succession. The spells are often where abilities and the scenery come in. For example, there's a magnet spell that lets you stick enemies to the nearest piece of metal. But if you're in the forest, for example, there's not much metal around, so it's pretty useless. This actually adds a bit of strategy to the fights. Also, what I really like is that your opponent always has a human character with a book as well. You can see them in the levels, and you can just run up to them and punch them in the face a few times, and they'll drop their book. When they do this, they can't actually attack you at all. You can't pick up their book, unfortunately, but you can keep on top of it and try to prevent them from getting it back, knocking it further and further away from them. Each level also gives you a random objective, like having to defeat an enemy, survive a time limit, knock a book out of someone's hand, and that sort of thing. It's not always just a case of fighting. The game looks decent enough with some nice cartoony graphics. I thought it would be cell shaded, but it's not really, though it still looks decent enough with good animation. It's a very simple game with just a few buttons to worry about, and I can see that some people were put off by the lack of depth, but for me, it was a cool little unique game that was different to other things that I've played, so if it looks good to you, then give it a try. Let's get racy now with Zero Four Champ Series Drift Champ. What a catchy name. This is a Japan-only racing game that features a few game modes, including a pretty in-depth story mode, as well as your classic arcade, time trials and verses. 
If you choose the story mode, you get to wade through a hell of a lot of Japanese text and there is quite a language barrier, so beware. No surprises, but you are a fledgling racer and you start out with a kinda crappy car. You talk to a bunch of people about a bunch of stuff, make a few decisions and take parts in races across Japan. Then there's a lot more story to keep it all going, getting you access to more cars, customising the ones you have, and so on. It is a basic car racing RPG, which is pretty cool, but it would be better if I knew what the hell was going on. Not to worry though, as there's the arcade mode, where you choose from cars that you've unlocked to take part in a series of races against other opponents, which of course you want to win. Though interestingly, there's not actually positions in these races. It's all done on time, and I was never penalised for being absolutely shite. You get a variety of licensed cars to choose from, including the likes of Nissan and Subaru, and plenty more that I'm sure people who care about cars will get excited about. Once you've chosen your car, then you can customise it, not just the colour, but also how it's tuned up, so you can adjust the tyres, suspension and all that stuff. I don't know anything about tuning cars, and not to mention it's all in Japanese anyway, so I just stuck with the defaults, and I did alright. If you're doing the arcade mode, you just take on a series of races across various cities and tracks. These range from massive wide tracks that can take a few minutes per lap, to shorter narrow ones that are over before you know it. I actually quite like the variety here. You get a number of opponents, but these are more obstacles than anything, as it doesn't really matter if you come in before or after them most of the time, which is kind of strange, and I'm sure there's a proper reason for it that I just don't understand. As the name of the game alludes to, the main thing you need to learn here is the drifting, and it's a pretty fun mechanic, but it can take a while to get used to. When you're turning a corner, the drift automatically kicks in. Normally, you'd expect to tap a button or something, but that's not needed here. Instead, you just start turning and you'll suddenly drift to the corner if it needs it. This can be quite jarring at first, but when you get used to it, which will take a bit of time, it is quite fun and you'll be able to do some pretty sweet turns. Though I still can't figure out how you do this on really tight corners, as braking here is really tricky, but that's probably because I haven't tuned the car up properly. After I did a few races though, I did find that I wanted to check out all the tracks, and it is always fun in games like this to unlock the new cars and courses. The game doesn't look particularly impressive, the car models are fine and the scenery looks very 2000s arcades with a surprising amount of pop in, but it does run smoothly, which is the main thing. And it does play fine, it would be good fun against another player if you like racing games, that's for sure. Now, it definitely isn't a game that's worth importing, as there are much better games out there, but for what it is, it's pretty fun. Here is Zoid's Legacy. Zoid's is a great franchise that I used to have a few toys of back in the early 90s, I'm sure, and I even had a Commodore 64 game based on it, but I had no idea what I was doing on that game. Anyway, this one here on the PS2 is a 3D arena battle game that I believe was only released in Japan. In case you don't know, Zoids are basically animal robots armed to the teeth with lasers and rockets, so of course the best thing to do is battle them. Here you get a story mode, arcade mode and some multiplayer options. No matter the mode, the gameplay is basically the same. You choose from a decent roster of Zoids, with a few more that can be unlocked. You have a Sabretooth Tiger Zoid, Gorilla Zoid, Lion Zoid, Wolf Zoid, Jesus is hard to say Zoid, and there's even dinosaur ones like a T-Rex. Each Zoid has various stats in terms of speed, attack, defense and so on. There's the usual mix of slow and strong, fast and weak and everything in between. Each Zoid also has its own weapons. You get ranged and melee. There's rockets, lasers, machine guns, grenades and more. And you've got plenty of ammo for all your weapons and some are even unlimited. But each weapon does have a cooldown so you can't just spam them over and over for the most part. If you're close enough to an enemy you will automatically do melee rather than use your ranged weapons. These attacks are very powerful, but harder to connect with as your opponent won't be hanging around for long. As you can see, it's all a 3D arena, very similar to games like Sega's Virtual On, and it works really well. The battles are always the best of three, and they start off pretty easy, but definitely get tricky as you play, with a few boss fights in that will kick your ass. Each of your weapons is mapped to a different shoulder button, and you can use the analog, d-pad, or even face buttons to control and move around. It can take a bit of while getting used to the strafing and things here, which is quite slow. But what do you expect? You're a giant massive robot. Also, as you battle, you earn points. These can be used in between fights to upgrade your robots, buy new parts, and so on. It's easy to keep track of what's going on here, thanks to the HUD, and there's plenty of Japanese text and voice to let you know what's going on between fights and for the story, if that's any use to you. I believe the game is based on the cartoon version, so I'm sure the characters will be familiar if you've seen any of that. The game looks good as well, with some really cool looking robot designs, and the animation is excellent. I really do like this sort of game, and it's smooth looks. 
The gameplay here isn't particularly deep though, with just basic attacks and no real bells and whistles, but it's still a very fun arena fighter with some awesome animal mechs that I'd recommend giving a go if you like some robot on robot action. Right, let's get our zombie on with the imaginatively named Zombie Attack from Budget King's 505 Games. In fact, the next few games are all from them, I think. Fun. Zombie Attack takes place during a zombie attack, believe it or not, and you play as Fu Yu, a monster hunter, and in this particular scenario you've got the job of making your way up a high-rise building floor by floor, killing all the zombies and other monsters you find while rescuing any civilians along the way. The gameplay is very simple. You explore each floor one by one. You meet a ton of zombies along the way and you'll need to dispose of them. You've got three weapons at your command. You've got a sword, which is what you'll mostly be using. You've got a basic combo with this that you do by hammering the square button. This does decent enough damage and is pretty effective. You can also hold down the attack button to do a more powerful charge combo. But the risk here is that you can't move while it's charging, so you leave yourself open to attack. And at times there can be quite a few enemies around you, so be careful. Though if you do pull it off, you often get a cool little cutscene of you slicing and dicing. You also have a gun. This is quite weak, but it's good from a distance. You can't move and shoot, and once again you have to charge for a more powerful shot that does good damage and knocks anyone it hits down to the ground. And finally you've got your magic rice. Fair enough. This is basically rice that you throw above your head and it does a little damage to everyone around you. It's good if you are surrounded and it makes enemies stagger back. Something that's kind of cool here is that enemies are technically invincible. No matter how much you attack them, they will keep getting back up. But after enough of a beating, they'll get this weird purple mist around them. This means that they're weak enough for you to use your magic cards and throw one at an enemy and they'll be banished to some other realm. This is really cool, and in case you didn't know, it's basically a thing in Japanese folklore, I believe. I've seen it in a few movies, anime series, and actually a couple of games. Using your weapons levels them up as well, with each attack giving you some XP. You can also find power-ups in the levels that do the same, giving your weapons more power permanently. You also need to rescue survivors. There's multiple ones on each floor and you're told how many you need to get to complete the level. These have to be found and led to an exit. Thankfully you never have to rescue all of them, as some will probably die as they're pretty stupid and will just run into bad guys. You can tell them to wait for you though while you go and fight, and you can even just decide to leave them alone if you want to get enough survivors to the exit though and you move up a floor with harder enemies and more obstacles in the way. It looks as you'd expect a budget game too with basic graphics that aren't great but they're fine. The levels are all grey and brown as you'd expect with most games of the era and style but it's alright. The controls are also a little janky, they do work fine for the most part but it's all a little stiff, nothing you won't get used to after a few minutes though. Overall it's a very budget game but it's still pretty fun. It's got a certain addictive quality to it that makes you want to keep going, and you get new enemies introduced every few levels which also helps. It's actually worth a look if you can find it. Next is Zombie Virus, another budget game about zombies, and I genuinely really like this one. You play as one of a handful of survivors in a city, and you've got an ambulance. Zombies are everywhere, but you're determined to get out there and save everyone you can. You set out in your ambulance from your hideout, where you just have to drive around the small open world and pick up survivors. It's kind of like a cross between Carmageddon and Crazy Taxi. You have a radar, so you have a little help when you're close to a survivor, and you're always told how many there are in the part of town that you're in. Once you pick one up though, you've got a limited amount of time to get them back to your base, which is the hospital, before they turn into a zombie. Get them back there so they're cured, and then they hang out in your base. And the thing I love is that the more people the rescue, the more things open up for you. For example, you can rescue mechanics, who are probably the most important people, as the more of these you have, the more vehicles they can fix up for you to drive, as well as providing upgrades to your engines, tyres, lights, and even offensive things, like adding spikes to vehicles. When you've rescued enough mechanics, these options become available, but to actually unlock them, you'll then need to go out into the city and kill zombies. So for example, to unlock a new motor, you might need to rescue 10 mechanics, and then go out and kill 150 zombies, return to your base, and they would have made it. I don't know how this works, but who cares. You kill zombies by running them over, unsurprisingly, and there's an unlimited amount in the city, so it's never too hard to do but you will take damage as you drive around, so you'll need to be careful that you return to your base every now and then to get your vehicle fixed back up. 
Unlocking no vehicles is also important, as they can carry more survivors. When you start, you can only take one person at a time, but you'll soon get vehicles that you carry two or three or more, and of course they've got a variety of speed, handling and armour stats. There's also politicians to rescue. Now, normally I'd say leave them to the zombies, but here they give you access to new areas in the city, so you will want to rescue them. This lets you visit new places with more survivors, but be careful as these places are far away and you still need to get all the way back to the hospital without your survivors dying. Now, there are pickups that are randomly appear and they can repair your vehicle or heal people, essentially giving you more time while you're out driving. But these are hard to find and they won't appear on the radar, but get yourself an upgraded vehicle and some boosts and you'll probably be alright. Killing zombies is very easy, you just run them over, but it does do a little damage to you and some will end up on your roof so you'll need to shake both analogue sticks to get them off. There's even bosses in the game and you'll need to figure out how to expose their weak spot so you can ram into them with your car to kill them. I don't know what it is, but I just find this whole thing so damn fun and addictive. It doesn't look great, but it's a budget game so can be forgiven, but the controls are decent enough and the upgrades you unlock really make a difference. This really is a game that I highly recommend trying out. I really did have fun with it and plan on going back to finish it. Booby time now with Zombie Zone 2, sometimes known as Wanchan Bara. This is a series of games that's still being made to this day and you can see why. Here you get to take control of one of two Bikini Samurai zombie hunters, and the story is nothing really more complex than there are zombies and monsters being brought to life, so you've got to go out and kill them all. It doesn't really matter which character you choose, as they basically play the same, but what I do like is that you can change characters between levels, so you're not stuck with the same one for the whole game. Gameplay is simple, you're in a fairly large maze-like level that's packed with enemies, and often a bunch of locked doors. You just have to fight your way through the level until you get to the boss and defeat it. There's always dozens of enemies on screen for you to take out, but thankfully you don't always have to kill them all, and often there's not really much benefit in doing so, as you don't level up or anything. But if there's a locked door or magic barrier you can't get past, then chances are you just need to kill everything you can find to proceed, or at least until you kill the enemy that's carrying the key or whatever it is that you need though they're never highlighted. Doing the killing is of course your main thing, and you've got a few combos that you can do, and you'll always have a sword. It's mostly just a case of button mashing, and the sword will chop enemies into pieces with a nice amount of blood splattering all over the place. You've also got a kick button. This is quite weak, but it pushes enemies backwards, so it's actually pretty handy. If there's a large group of enemies, you want to probably start with a running kick as it sends them flying, and we'll let you focus on one or two at a time. You can block, and also lock onto a single enemy if you need to be focused, but I didn't really bother too much with that. There are a few strange things that happen in the game though that can take a minute to get used to. Firstly, your sword has a blood meter, showing how much blood is on it. If it gets too high, you'll do less damage, and it'll become blunt basically. Thankfully, you've got a button that lets you get the blood off the sword, so you just need to press that every couple of minutes to make sure you're doing maximum damage. While that's about as complex as the gameplay gets, it is still fun to run around killing stuff, I will say that the levels do drag on a bit longer than they need to, with you needing to go back and forth between the same few rooms over and over. Some took me nearly an hour to complete, even though they were just small levels. And yes, this is very similar to the first game which I covered in the O letter, and the eagle-eared of you might have noticed that this review is also very similar to that review. That wasn't an accident. But it looks decent enough, and they've clearly focused on the right assets here, and if you're a fan of hack and slash gameplay and knockers, then this might just be the game for you. Next up is yet another budget title, Zoo Cube. This is a puzzle game which has a weird story about a mad scientist who's made a bunch of animals across the world all misshapen and trapped them in various locations, so you hop in your flying ark and go around the world where you have to rescue animals with the Zoo Cube. It's kind of nonsense. It's a puzzle game, so it's pretty simple in terms of gameplay, but challenging when you actually play it. Basically, you control the cube in the middle of the screen, and you can turn it in any direction. Animal pieces will fall towards the cube, and your job is to match two of the same pieces to make the animal normal again. Do this enough, and you'll move to the next level. Now, the actual animals don't make any difference. The only thing you have to do is match them, but it's easier said than done. 
You can rotate the cube in increments in any direction, but honestly the control is sometimes confusing and I wasn't sure which way I had to press on the D-pad to rotate in the direction that I wanted, which meant I would end up with a piece in a place I didn't want it to be. But to be fair, I fully accept that this is mainly a me problem and smarter people probably won't have this issue. If two pieces of animal that don't match touch, they will stick together, creating a long line. You need to make sure you don't keep adding to this, as if you get too many bits that don't match, it's game over, and the longer lines give you much less time to position the cube where you need it. It can be very hard to fix mistakes. You also get bonus points by balancing the cube. This is done by having the right animals on the right coloured dots on the centre of the cube, or by having one of each animal, and no more, on the cube. There's a few game modes here, like story, arcade, puzzle and so on, but they all basically play the same. Just keep matching animals until you're told to stop, or you get a game over. As with all puzzle games, it is simple and actually pretty fun, and it's definitely a lot more challenging than a lot of the puzzle games and will take a while to get used to. Also, each level sees more animal types being introduced and the speed increasing, further making things tricky. It doesn't look particularly impressive, it's from Midas, who are a budget label. The backgrounds are pretty crappy looking JPEGs and the animal models are very basic, but they do the job, which is kind of what I say about every puzzle game really. But the gameplay is fun. I don't think it's one that you'll be rushing back to every day, but it is fun enough for a few hours and you'll do worse than putting this on every couple of months. And finally for today, another zoo based puzzle game with Zoo Puzzle. This is a match 3 game featuring zoo animals. When I fired it up I had a memory unlocked, I'm sure I used to have this on the Nintendo DS. Anyway, Zoo Puzzle is simple, you've got to match 3 or more animals to clear them, and that is literally all there is to the gameplay. There's a bunch of game modes though, you've got a quest mode where you play through various different levels, the game keeps track of how many of each animal you've cleared and depending on the level you might have to focus on a certain animal type, needing to clear 100 elephants for example to proceed, other times you just need to clear a total number of animals and so on. It's never overly complicated but it's really damn addictive. There's also a few other game modes like a time attack where you've got to make a certain number of matches in a time limit, whole hog mode where you level up by catching a hundred of the same animal, score attack and so on. But again, the gameplay never changes. You constantly have a timer at the bottom of the screen and this is filled a little every time you make a match and the more animals per match or combo you do, the more time you get back. And as you level up, the timer gets faster, really upping the challenge. The graphics are very basic, just 2D sprites, but I really like how it looks. It's very colourful and the animal designs are actually pretty cool, but it's certainly not going to make your jaw drop. And honestly that's all there is to say about this one, it's a match 3 game. There's not really any bells or whistles, but it's just damn addictive and I ended up playing for nearly 2 hours just to get the footage for this video. I would recommend grabbing a copy of this one if you find it, I can't imagine it's all that common though, but from what I see online it's pretty damn cheap, so worth a look as it is bloody addictive. So there you go, 10 games for the PlayStation 2 starting with the letter Z that you might not have tried. Which one is your favourite, and what else could I have included? I know Zone of the Enders isn't here, but I'll live. On screen now you can see where you can follow me, so why not do so? I've got loads of great content for everyone to enjoy. And now all that's left for me to say is thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.